Uh, well, welcome to, uh, to everyone. Uh, this year again, for the second time, we're really, really, really happy to uh, welcome uh, Ken Loach, screenwriter, because we can, we, can, uh, we can name you Ken Loach, screenwriter. How many, how many uh, scripts did you wrote with uh, Ken Loach? What, I, I, I can't remember, to yeah. be honest. Uh, I suppose, I think it's about, um, we've been working together for 25 years, and I think it's maybe about 14 or something. Yeah, uh, 14. Something, so I don't know, I'm not exactly sure. So he's really Ken Loach, screenwriter. He's Paul Laverty. Yeah. So this time again uh, in competition, after two Palme uh, d'Or, we're sorry we missed you, but uh, let's let's jump back again. Uh, how Paul Laverty come to came to writing? And um, well, first of all, thanks very much for coming along. It's lovely to see old friends again. <laughs> we were here three years ago with Daniel Blake. Uh, I don't know where those three years have gone. Too fast. Uh, so anyway, and and I'm very very sorry. This has to be in English. Because um, I, I can't speak French. I'm very sorry. I could do it in Spanish, but not in, not in French. And it seems a great pity I can't speak to you in your own language. So my apologies for that. Um, anyway, I, I can you hear me okay? Can you hear? If I'm speaking too quickly with my Glaswegian accent, you know, just shout. I remember a long time ago, we showed a film here called uh, Sweet Sixteen. I can't remember. It must have been about 10 years ago. And it was in, you know, the west coast of Scotland and all the English film critics couldn't understand a word and they were reading the French subtitles <laughs> so when we came back with Angel Share which was written in Glasgow as well they had the French subtitles and then the English subtitles underneath you know so um, so uh, anyway um, so I hope you understand me um, I, I started screenwriting by accident like most things in my life to cut a very long story short um, I was, uh, I used to work as a lawyer, I was a lawyer in Glasgow and then like many people in their mid-twenties I think they want to escape an office, they want to learn a new language, they want to go and travel the world and, um, and look forward to Mondays which has always been my grand master plan is to look forward to Mondays. So um, anyway to cut a very long story short I worked with a, with a group of activists and we went to, um, I went to work in Nicaragua and my friends were doctors and nurses and they had a useful job. You know, they could actually do something useful. And, um, and uh, to cut a very long story short, I ended up working with a, a human rights organisation. And um, it was before many of you youngsters were born. But um, it's a history worth revisiting because, you know, in 1979, there was the Sandinista Revolution. And what they do is they overthrew a, a corrupt dictatorship. And after they did that, there was a revolution to try to redistribute the land, they taught their population to read and write, and um, they wiped out polio, and um, and the United States was very unhappy about this because they lost their their man who was the dictator there, a guy called Somoza, and so they organised a dirty war to undermine the Sandinistas, and so there was great solidarity for people around the world. It was like our Spanish Civil War, really. And um, so many people from around the world went along to support the Sandinistas, which only had a population of about three million people. And so I was an eyewitness to the United States um, trying to destroy this tiny little country. Systematic abuse, human rights, torture, murder, the things that the CIA do but deny they don't. Um, and there was economic um, warfare as well. Um, embargoes, they put pressure on the IMF and the World Bank to undermine Nicaragua. So I suppose I was an eyewitness to how a little country was totally and absolutely destroyed. And anyway, so I worked for a human rights organisation then. I was an eyewitness to it. And then in my naivety, I thought after three years of this, doing so many human rights reports, that when I went back to, to the UK again, went back to Scotland, I said, I'm going to write a film about this. And um, I had no idea how to do it. Um, but I was very determined, and so I bought some books, talked to some people, wrote to lots and lots of people who never wrote back to me. I'm sure many people will be in the same boat. Um, the few people that did write back said, are you joking? You've never written a screenplay before. You want to take us to a war zone, you know, and we're going to do a story about some 
insignificant little revolution. That was the subtext to most of it. Most didn't write back. Um, but I also wrote to Mr. Ken Loach. And so um, I prepared an idea for a story and I sent it off to him. And one day I was doing the dishes and um, and he phoned up and said, you fancy a cup of tea? Which I did. I fancied a cup of tea. <laughs> so I went away down to London for a cup of tea with Ken Loach. And um, and that was the beginning of a, a long relationship, really. Aye, so, and uh, to cut a very long story short again, it took five years from then to make, make the film. But we made a little film called Carla's Song uh, with a lovely actor called Bobby Carlyle. And it was a story about a bus driver who meets a Nicaraguan refugee in Glasgow and they go back to Nicaragua. And uh, it wasn't a very good script. Uh, but anyway, we made it. And, um, and then one story kind of led to another and led to another and led to another. And here we are, 25 years later, um, sitting in the sunshine, and I managed to escape the office. So I feel very lucky and very relieved. That was a long answer. Sorry, I didn't mean it to be that long. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you if there is, um, uh, in, in the story you want to talk uh, about, if the, the fact you were born in Calcutta, mm. is there... Uh, is there? I, I don't know if you stay long there, but um, is there a connection? Uh, does uh, inspires inspires you about this? Mm. Or I wish I could. Um, I'm almost tempted to make up an answer. It's such a good question, but the reality was I was born in Calcutta, in India, uh, but I left there at nine months. Oh, nine months. But but I would like to invent a story and say yes, it had a great effect on my psyche. Uh, but it would just be pure invention. Um, I've tried to get back several times to India, um, but I've never actually managed to do it. I actually had a foot in a plane once, but it's a very long story, and I was almost there and didn't quite work out. But um, one day I, I hope to go. But really, I suppose my hunger for travel came from from one main, very very significant experience in my life. Um, my mum was, you know, she came from a very, you know, she was a very humble background in Ireland. My father. He was born to Catholic parents who had come from Ireland as well. So we were kind of typical, you know, um, children of, you know, Irish immigrants. And um, so at the age of 11, I was sent off to seminary to be a priest. And so I was sent from the age of 11 to so all my secondary school up until the age of 18 was, you know, being taught by priests. And then from the ages of 18, I went, and then I was sent off to study in Rome to become a priest which is just surreal now, I can hardly believe it, but that's actually happened to me and I can't believe it. And um, so I was taught by Jesuits and the Jesuits taught us Marxism to undermine Marxism. And um, and so it became very intellectually claustrophobic. We were taught by priests, we were praying, we were in church and everyone was black and white. And, um, and in a strange way, I suppose writing is a reaction to that, you know, because I had such a thirst And, uh, you know, when, you, when you're only, in eight, you know, when you're 20, you don't know. But I had this thirst to see everything in the world, to see the different colours, different experiences, to hear different points of view. Yeah. And even now as a writer, what fascinates me is not the black and white, but the grey, the contradictions, the different points of view. So I suppose being locked up for so long, you know, in this very kind of tight, straight-jacketed intellectual world probably was, I suspect probably is the reason why I still feel so curious about the world. You know, still want to travel, still want to go everywhere. Although I can't do that now, because I've got three boys. Uh, but I still would love to, you know, I've got that curiosity to say, right, what is on the other side of the mountain? And I think if you've got that as a writer, to be curious, to be curious to be in somebody else's shoes, to try and imagine what it's like to be in that person's view and to see the world from their point of view, which you could probably never imagine, is a... It's still something I still find exhilarating. Mm. You know, I mean, to be honest, I'd much rather interview you than hear me say this again. Beloved, to know, well, how did you become a writer? You know, what, what was the story you want to tell? You know, um, what is the thing that really you want to achieve in three or four years' time? You know, why do you want to do that? Is there something in your past at the back there that you're just burning to tell and why? Is there something that makes you absolutely furious? Is there something that really makes you laugh? Is there something that touches you? You know, is there something about the world just now you'd like to communicate, but you don't know why, why to do it? But there's something inside you that makes you burn to want to do that. And uh, and uh, I, th I think these are kind of all... I think you have to have an instinct 
to investigate all that if you, if you want to be a writer. And then the great trick then is to find other collaborators who've got other skills who want to share, to share that with you. So uh, you, you've written so many scripts with, with Ken that we, we imagine that uh, the writing is automatic with him. The work is automatic, but, but in reality, how, how does it work? I mean, how, how do, you, do you find the, the, the subject? How you, do, you, do you agree with him? or uh, Does he agree with you? How does it work? Uh -huh. Well, I don't want to just say I work with Ken because I have the great privilege, too, of working with a, a terrific... Um, Spanish director called the Theer Boyain, and um, so I don't see my work with the Theer as inferior or superior to to, to my work with Ken, um, and and the process is very similar to both of them. But obviously the chemistry of working with whatever person you know changes. So, um, but I feel both with with Ken Loach and the Theer Boyain, we have a great deal in common. We're very close friends apart from everything else. But friendships don't make necessarily for good stories, otherwise it'd be a hell of a lot, you know, be more films, wouldn't there? Um, but the process is quite organic, and um, I mean, we have very different jobs. I mean, I think, like, you know, a writer writes, Ken and the theatre directs, but we meet in the middle as filmmakers. And I think that's, I've been very, very lucky to find these generous directors, because we're involved in the whole process, you know, from the idea to writing the script, they always use them as a bouncing board, and um, and also the casting and being on the shoot with them is very very important, especially with Ken because you know uh, me and Athea are partners and we get children, so I go to look after the children when she's directing. But um, but the process is still similar. So um, Nicholas, every story is slightly different. Um, you know, sometimes, for example, we did a film here it was shown in Cannes some years back called Looking for Eric, with Eric Cantona. Which was kind of a, you know, it was fun and comic, but underneath it was still a kind of a family, family drama, and that kind of happened by accident because um, Eric came to us and he wanted to make a film with us, and um, and we, of course he wanted to do a story about a fan in Leeds, and I, I couldn't find a way into that, and it wasn't what grabbed me, but you know, um, but there was something about Eric that I really loved, and he um, had great presence and stature and confidence, and I imagined just meeting him. What happened if there's another little Eric who's the exact opposite of him, who's not a performer, who's unrecognised, who has panic attacks, who's insignificant, his family is all broken up, his children don't see him, he feels like his life slipping through his own fingers. And what happens if big Eric is a figment of his imagination after too many spliffs? You know, and um, I'm, you know, I said to Eric, do you fancy that? And he started laughing. And so that was the start of that, that project. And Ken thought it'd be fun and a way of examining. It's actually a story about grandparents, you know, but if you'd actually try to raise a film, raise money for a film about grandparents, everybody would tell you to piss off. You know, they would just say, no chance. But that is actually a film about two grandparents. But because it's tied up into a kind of comic um, premise and with Cantona, you know, we got away with it. Other stories, it's things that, you know, impinge upon us that we feel are really, really important to do, like the film we're doing just now, or Daniel Blake. These were things that we saw around us that attracted our attention, and I started digging into it to try and find out what was going on under the surface. And so a great deal of the last two stories that we've just done, part of the work has been very journalistic. You know, as to try and... F we did, I don't know if you've seen Daniel Blake, I, Daniel Blake... Um, but it's a story about an older man who signs on in Great Britain. He has a, he gets caught up in a Kafkaesque world of bureaucracy inside the welfare system, and really it's how the man is destroyed. You know, but underneath it was great cruelty by the state. You know, they wanted to make people's lives very, very difficult, so they accept crappy jobs. It was against the backdrop of austerity and financial cuts. You know, so but you've got to do the work to understand what's going on underneath. You have to find the people who have lived it. You've got to speak to whistleblowers who work in these organisations. And so you have to kind of break it down and understand the big picture. Then afterwards, what you have to do then is forget it and then create characters and tell a story and try and find a simple line all the way through. So, um, so one part of it was kind of journalistic and investigative and analytic. But then the second part is imagination and trying to figure out a way to tell the story as best you can. And um, so me and Ken will, I like to test the idea by putting things on paper, 
you know, suggesting the characters, the premise, the essential conflicts, an idea of the narrative, things that might or might not happen. So it's like kind of, you know, it's kind of a, it's a big splashing out of possibilities. You know, and then I like to talk about it and think about it. You know, and then um, and then if we feel we're in sec secure ground, I might do some more research, and then I'll just go away and write the screenplay, try and write it as quickly and as much piece as possible. Just do that by myself, so that you feel like you're living it, so you're almost watching the film unravel before your eyes for the first time, and then um, and then I'll just show that to Ken, and then we just try to be our own toughest critics. You know, say what we liked or what we didn't like, what the problems were, would it be possibly trying this? And then I'll do another draft. And we just kind of, you know, knock it back and forward. But, you know, and I would never ask him to direct something he didn't feel secure in. And Ken never tries to force me to write something I don't believe in. So it's kind of, that's why I say we, I write, he directs, and we meet in the middle as the filmmakers. And our, and our loyalty is to the project, you know, because... You know, shooting a film is the art of the possible. And if you try and do things that are too complex or just far too expensive, you know, it's pointless. You know, I've just done a film with a theater, a theater boy in, about a Cuban ballet dancer called Carlos Acosta. It's called Yuli. And it's going to come out in France, I think, in the summer. And it's a kind of a, this is the first time I've done an adaption. You know, but um, at one point, we just, we didn't have enough money to do the film that we wanted to do. So I said, right, okay change the ending, we're going to cut a million pounds off the budget, and then we're going to do that. And then what we tried to do was to turn that into an advantage. So instead of having the big giant kind of plans that we had for the end of the film, you have to find something more original, more subversive, and much, much cheaper. And sometimes, sometimes it's an advantage, and I think it helped us a lot. And I think Ethier did a really, really nice job if you get a chance to see it, you know, later on in the summer. Isiar is the um, is, um, uh, only um, woman director you worked with, I think. Yes. And um, you told us that um, the, the, the work was quite similar than Ken Loach. But is there um, a, a, a difference to work with a woman than a man? Uh, as a director, a female director? Um, is it? I don't know how... I don't know the, the answer to that, really. Um, I mean, she's just a different person, you know, and uh, obviously I think gender makes a big influence on how, how people's experience and how they work. But the process is, is very, very similar. You know, I mean, the, the actual working process is the same. Athea is a very demanding partner, but she's very generous, you know, and, um, and I suppose the films that we've made together have been different from the stories I've done with Ken. You know, when you see Yuli, we actually try to dance a film. We try to dance aspects of his life. So it's not as naturalistic as the stories we've done with Ken. And we also did a film called Tambien la Lluvia, Even the Rain, yeah. that was, you know, shot in Bolivia. You know, and, um, you know, that was going off into the jungle and dealing with 500 years of exploitation. And, you know, and um, so I don't know if Ken, I mean, he's got great physical stamina, but I don't think he'd have... You know, he, he may have done it when he was younger, but he's not going to go to Bolivia in the rain, rainy season in the jungle, you know, his age. Uh, although he, we went to Nicaragua and we went to to um, Bread and Roses, you know, so... Um, but there was a, there's a... There's probably... A prob the, the, the style of films I've, I've done with the theatre have probably been less naturalistic, you know, and it's nice to try other ways of doing things. With Yuli, for example, because it was a biopic, I told them, I told Carlos, the wonderful Cuban dancer, I didn't know if I'd be able to do it, but um, I went out to Cuba and I saw the dancers, and they just took my breath away. You know, one day one was having a one, one was having a cigarette, and she had a cigarette in one hand, and in her right hand she had her leg up to her forehead like that, holding her leg. You know, and I saw Jesus Christ, that's unbelievable. You know, you don't talk to people like that, and then you saw them dancing afterwards. You know, and they were so. What struck me was just the discipline and the hard work. They were all sore, they were, but they practiced and they practiced and they practiced. And then I saw moments of beauty and I thought, this is like watching Champions League. How crazy not to use this beautiful, beautiful possibility. And I said to Athea, let's dance Carlos's life. So some is naturalistic, but some goes into dance. And the beauty about the dance was that um, you could be suggestive, it could be more abstract, but not so abstract that you just see a spectacle. 
So the secret was if we could try and adapt dance with all its abstraction and suggestion, but still serve the story. So it became like trying to use a, to a whole different vocabulary we hadn't tried before. And that's what made it exciting to try and do. You know, so... Um, um, but that was a... It's just... Um, and also, I suppose, with different personalities, we've all got different obsessions. You know, and um, you know that this particular film that we're just pr going to present now called Sorry We Missed You. I mean, that's a particular obsession that both Ken and myself have, you know, about the world of work, which affects every one of us. After, after 25 years as writer for, okay, for Ken Loach and other directors, what, what, what did change for you uh, as, a, as a screenwriter? Uh, is, is it easier? Is it, uh, is it uh, always hard or... Or what, what does does what did change in your work? <laughs> the biggest change is bloody children. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I've got I've got three sons: one 19, one 15, and one 11, and uh, and they drive me absolutely around the bend. Yeah, so but they're also very funny. They're very funny, and um, and because the theatre is away working a lot, so I'm really a hands-on dad. You know, I'm really so when I'm there, uh, you know, you do the, try to do the homework and you try to keep a house going and so what I've noticed is that um, I've just got such little time now you know so I try and use that time better so actually that's the biggest difference is trying to you know try to do what many women have done in previous generations balance and work in children so I'm always held that in absolute amazement and I, th and I think um, so that that really is honestly the biggest difference I suppose as you get older hopefully um, but I'm not sure about this you know, you you begin to well, you search for other things. I think you're searching for more complexity, sometimes in a more simple fashion. But you want to go deeper, I think, because you've had more life experience. You know, but also, um, um, I don't. It's very hard to reflect on your on the changes in yourself, isn't it? I suppose when you get older, you just see you try to see more connections with things. You know, so I, th I think that is one thing, and also hopefully. It's a great privilege to make films. I mean, it's an absolutely an amazing kind of privilege, you know, to be here to present the film to the world like this. And so I never ever take it for granted. And it's a massive effort. So you always want to try and do something that's worthwhile, not to waste the opportunity, not to do something in automatic pilot, not to do something that doesn't stretch you. So I always feel like you really, really have to be rigorous and try and build new horizons for yourself so that you're not being lazy. And um, and that's the beauty of working with a wonderful collaborator like Ken, you know, and a theatre. They're both very demanding, you know, they're very, very, I mean, they're very demanding because they're just so smart, but they're also very, very generous. So um, it's always good to work with smart people. <laughs> do, do you that think, helps. Do you think through the years, uh, uh, the, the, the collaboration with, with, with Ken Loach, is, uh, are you uh, asking more uh, than before? And uh, does he ask um, asking you more than before um, in the work? Um, I, I, it's very hard to know, really. I mean, when I started off, I mean, I was so naive. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I just, it wasn't my world. I didn't know. So I was kind of... Um, I was just following instinct and trying things out, and I made lots of mistakes. Sometimes it was too complicated. And a great lesson I learned from Ken, and one of his friends was a guy called Roger Smith, who was a script editor, who was a lovely man who Ken knew from university. And um, um, Roger had written a lot of screenplays himself, and plays and produced plays. So both men had, and they're all both steeped in Shakespeare and, and the arts and literature. And they're men of kind of, um, they're kind of, um, Renaissance men in a way, you know, they've read a lot, they're interested in lots of things. And, you know, they're 20 years older than me. So I learned a lot from just listening to them. And, you know, so um, at the beginning, I just try to listen, try to learn, but also try to be true to my own voice, you know, and um, and, um, and I've never been scared just to try something, you know, and, and Ken is one of these remarkable, he's like a good football manager. You ever seen those managers at the side of a football pitch? Sorry to go back to football. I know this will bore every, many people to death. But you see those managers screaming and shouting at their players. And it always strikes me as a kind of remarkable stupidity. You know, because, I mean, if you shout at a kid and try them to get to do what they can't do, I mean, it's humiliating, isn't it? Because they just get angrier and angrier and the kid just loses more and more confidence. You know, and you see, you see managers doing that, you see bosses doing it. 
You see fathers doing it to their children. You know, and I think what you have to try and do is, is see what they're capable of and have some sense of that and then give them confidence to fulfill that talent. And Ken is a master at that. And I think it's because he's very, very humane. And also I think it's because he's really smart. You know, because if you, if you I mean, I, I remember once watching a theater play being rehearsed and it was a director who was getting angrier and more frustrated. And I think it was because he'd lost confidence in the play and he was trying to get the actor to do something that was just impossible. You know, and it was just excruciating. I mean, maybe you've seen that. You must have seen that in your own lives at some point. You know, and people flower when they've got confidence. You know, when they feel secure. That's when people kind of grow. And um, I have to say, Jen, Ken has just been a remarkable encourager, you know, and to have a crack at something. Because at the beginning, I had no idea if I could do it, not a clue. And still now, when I sit down to write, I feel like, Jesus, will I ever be able to do another one? I really honestly sit down, and you feel like there's a mountain to climb. How many of you are screenwriters here, by the way? Hands, hands, hands. Oh, my God, I well. Yes, well, see, that's... I don't know if you had that. Maybe you're much more confident than me, but I sit down and go, holy shit, you know? <laughs> You know, and then away, and away I think you have to just, I mean, I remember reading an article many, many years ago about the human brain, how many tendrils and synapses and neurons and, you know, things that go on in the brain that are beyond our control. And away I think sometimes you just have to relax and not be too over-intellectual about it. And I think if you've got a quirky brain that suits a writer, you've probably been attracted to that. Your brain makes funny jumps, you know what I mean? Just like when I saw Eric Cantona, I had a terrible flu. And I remember a great goal he scored against Sunderland. And um, it just popped into my head. And he, you know, he did a lovely one-two. And he looked up. And there's 50,000 in the crowd. And he just chipped the ball. And it went into the corner. And I mean, it was sublime. It was a moment of genius. And it was body and intellect, you know, and personality all in one moment. You know, and then he stuck out his chest like only Eric Cantona could. And he turned to the four corners of the pitch. You know, and... It was just like an amazing image. And, but that, in that same moment I told you about, the little Eric, a sort of skinny wee guy and, you know, losing confidence. Nobody would listen to him. He, he was just like falling apart. And I said, what have they come together? Now, I don't know where that, you can't, you can't teach that. It's just a thing that pops into your head, which is totally stupid. And then you think, well, it is totally stupid. But then we told a story around it. You know, so sometimes you just have to trust your instinct, you know, and then say, well, Maybe that might work. And just to try it and to see it, you know? And so trust the connections. And this is sometimes I've read that, especially the Americans do, and this is, I've got a great respect for, you know, you know, some American scriptwriters. So this is not seen as a criticism, but I've read that sometimes what they like to do is do a 200 page treatment before they write the script. Holy shit, you know? I mean, you have no energy left by the end of it, you know? And it'd be so fucking boring doing 200 pages and then getting it back down again or doing a treatment. I mean, that would kill me. I would actually I'd, I'd jump in the bloody sea. <laughs> no, it really would kill me because all your energy's gone. 200 pages later, that's it. Fuck it, somebody else can do it. You know, I'm not, you know, 200 pages down to a 95 page script. You know, but if it works for them, you know, that's great. I've got no criticism. But sometimes then I think it might work like clockwork. But you know, sometimes if you see something that works like clockwork, it's like watching a clock and it's just really boring because there's no surprises. So what I like to try and do is, is something in between, you know, is to have some sense of the characters, try and do a history to the characters, because that can help you later on. Because it's great when you get surprised, like you get ambushed by a character. And I think, but if you, if you just go off following every daft notion that came into your head, you know, you'd end up with a total mess. So what I try to do is you have some strategic sense of where you're going, what is underneath it. But because you've lived it for so long in preparation, so I think when there's moments like that, that might take you by surprise. And I think these are the moments in the film which, um, which, which can, can touch you because sometimes it might seem counterintuitive. If you're just doing the 200-page treatment line by line by line by line, you know, you, would, you, you might not go there. But if you leave a bit, little bit of space to be ambushed, I think that's probably useful. But having said all this, guys, I hope you don't treat this too seriously because I think everybody has to find their own way. So, you know, I, I always... I remember, you know, listening to writers in your position, you know, and being kind of fascinated by how they do it. And some things made sense to me and some things didn't. So if it doesn't make sense, you know, rest assured it doesn't make sense. You know, it, it, might, it might be different for people from different generations, different cultures, 
different gender, different ways of looking at the world. So you have to find your, your own way. So I always treat everything that another writer says with, a, do you know the expression? To treat it with a big pinch of salt. No, not, 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 not to treat it too seriously. Um, I know it's difficult to talk about the st story of the, of the film but um, that is in Cannes now, but um, I wanted to ask you a, a question about uh, the gilet jaune, the yellow blanket. <laughs> um, is there... Um, uh, is there um, a connection or something that uh, could be tell about the story and what's going on right now in, in France? Um, thanks for that question. I think it's very interesting. I mean, the reality is you will know, people here will know much more about the Gilets Jaunes than I ever will. Um, because I think you understand your own culture and your own language and the different groups. But from the outside... What looks very interesting to me is, um, is um, well, it, it looks very multi-layered and there's many, many people arriving at a conclusion from different reasons. I understand there's all different factions and all that. But transcending that, I think there is something very, very important about these times. And I think our film does tap into it. You know, because when I wrote the script, it was like two years ago. By the time you get it, you know, by the time you get the script, the money, you shoot it, da-da-da-da, and you're here in Cannes. That was like two years ago. But what I think is, I think we did tap into whether it will communicate and transcend, I don't know. I think after climate change, I think the really big issue of the day is equality. You know, and um, now you'll know the figures much better for France. But, you know, when you look at the World Economic Forum in Davos, the richest people in the world, they are shitting themselves because they're scared of political instability. And much of that to do is the concentration of wealth. Now, in 2017, now this is totally, this sounds like a screenplay. See if I can remember the names. There's uh, Warren Buffett, do you know him? Yeah. Jeff Bezos, uh, Carlos Slim, telecoms in, uh, in Mexico. There's Zuckerberg, who's got Facebook. There's Ortega, who's got Zara. Uh, there's a guy called Leslie, oh God, no, what's his name, who owns a film called Oracle in the States at six. And there's another two. Who else is there? Uh, another two. Anyway, in 2017, they'll come back to me in a second. I like to remember the names. And I mentioned Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos of Amazon. So anyway, 2017, Oxfam did a study based on Credit Suisse. And they discovered that these eight men, eight men, controlled equal wealth as 50% of the world's population. Now, I mean, if you had that in a screenplay, you wouldn't believe it, would you? Yeah. yeah, but things have really improved. The good news is it's really improved because the figures have turned. Now there's 27 billionaires have got the same as um, as as 50 percent of the world. So you can see how, what a big difference there is. Uh, so it's almost surreal. And our little story is about a man who drives a white van and he delivers stuff, you know, for Amazon and all the different little shops. There's a big, huge crossover. They have the Titan app, they drive a white van and they deliver. I don't know if it's the same in France, but now in Britain, about a fifth of retail is actually done now by online. And he's married to a partner called Abby, who's a lovely woman, and she is a carer. And that was very interesting. I read that a lot of carers were in the Gilets Jaunes, uh, yeah, which, which I think is quite interesting. And anyway, what's happening with the carers in the UK, I don't know about in France, but they've got something called zero hour contracts. Yeah. You know, so you get guaranteed no holidays, no travel time at all. But what you've got to do is you respond to a text and then you work in the morning to get the old people up. Then you're there for lunch and then you're there in the evening to put them to bed. And then you get text the night before and you're getting moved around all over the place. You don't get paid any holidays. You don't get paid any sick money. You don't get paid for travel. You know, for a short visit, you get paid £2.50 for a 15-minute visit, but you have to travel there. Some go by bus, some have got a car, some can't pay for the petrol. But interestingly, if you look at both work, both jobs, what is fascinating is there's less and less trade unions, and what you have is technology being used to extract more and more and more profit. And these people are getting pushed harder and harder and harder and harder. And that's fascinating. Now, I'll... I'll tell you this little story. I talked to a guy who drove a van for Amazon. Uh, this is about two years ago before I wrote the script. Anyway, and I just said, right, tell me your day. 
you know, and um, and I went out with drivers as well because actually, you know, when you actually do the work with them and being with them and the stress they're under and the pip 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 of the app telling you what to do and you have to deliver within certain hours and you can't park, I mean, they don't have time to piss. Honestly, they've got an algorithm that knows exactly where you're going to be to the meter around the world off a satellite, okay? And there's an algorithm and it tells you where you've got to be. But they don't have, they don't have an algorithm. You can actually make a break if you want. But you've got so much work to do that they don't have a break. So what they're doing is they're just rushing, 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 rushing all over the place. But what you actually see is um, something that's very interesting too. They've got a thing called self-employment bogus self-employment. They call them owner-driver franchisee. So instead of being an employee, you say, no, you're a private businessman. You've got your own business. Absolutely beautiful. It's like, you know, the magician's trick on the street, you know, with the three coins. Because you're saying, right, okay, you pay for your own holidays. You pay for your own van. You know, um, you carry all the risk. And what you've seen is a massive transfer of power into more and more concentrated hands. And, um, and then they try to say, well, this is being an entrepreneur. You're now a businessman. Mm. So you carry the risk and the weight. No minimum wage, no nothing. So these people drive themselves into the ground. And so what you see is this great contract because they change the narrative. You know, and, um, and I think what's happened is more and more people now working, certainly in Britain, and also, in all, this is very, very interesting, in America too. Um, there was, um, a, I hope you don't mind getting too technical here, but there was a very, very interesting um, speech three days ago in London by Sir Angus Dayton, who is a Nobel laureate of economics. Um, he's, I think he teaches at Princeton University. And he said, for men in the United States who haven't got a college degree, um, their wages are now been stagnant for over 50 years. All right? And now for the last three years in the United States, life expectancy has gone down three years in a row. That hasn't happened for over a century, all right? Now, what do those pictures tell us? It tells us that more and more people are working harder and harder. They see more concentration of wealth. We see Jeff Bezos, who is now deemed to be this wonderful entrepreneur, you know, extracting more and more profit all of the time, pushing people harder and harder and harder. So is it any wonder that so many people just say, we are absolutely screwed here? Those politicians are in the pockets of these corporations who have got more and more power and influence. Okay, so there's an anger and a fury and they're feeling that their rights are not met. And you can actually see now in the UK, I don't know the figures are for France, but there's 14 million poor in the UK. Four million of those are, are, are workers, you know, like, but seriously poor. And then there's like four million children living in poverty as well. The rise in food banks has gone massively high. So what you see is people who are scared, people, there's precariousness, there's insecurity at work, they get a text the next day, they're humiliated economically, and out of that comes great anger. So our little story is a little family story, it's not less big grind stuff, but it's grounded in that grand narrative, because um, a story's got to be a story. And so it's a little intimate story of Ricky, who drives a white van, Abby, who's a care worker, a 15-year-old son called Rhys, and Liza Jane. And the reality is, because these people are working so hard, and they're coming back so late at work, they hardly see their children. So, although it's one tiny little family, I hope it taps into all those big things we have. And I, and I suspect, and you'll know better than me, whether that taps into the frustration that many of the Julie's own have as well. I don't know, I'd love to know what... Cause this could be much better if this was a dialogue instead of me going on and on. <laughs> So if anybody wants to say anything about that or has something to say, not a question, wants to say something, you know, please stick up your hand and give me the microphone. It's just about uh, to, to go back to the fact that we discussed about I, Daniel Blake, in a situation that was about unemployment. Um, what, what happens in the feedback you get from people who suffer this type of things like the Gilets Jaunes in France and people, uh, the consequences of the Brexit or whatever. As a, as a screenwriter, and you know that your film has been seen by people, do they, do they access, do they see your films and what does it give them? Uh -huh. Thanks for that question, it's really important because I've noticed that a lot of right-wing critics say that we make you know, left-wing films for the middle class and the elite, and it always makes me laugh yeah. because um, when I go to the prisons or I speak to young people, you know, in the junior prisons, and we bring the films back to these places, 
They've all seen the films. Mm. You know, they haven't seen them in the cinema. But, you know, you know, that's the beauty of it, cinema and story. It'll go to cinema, it'll go to wherever it goes, it finds its way to DVD or pirated or, or whatever. You know, so, so people do see them. And in particular with Daniel Blake, it was very, very interesting because, like I say, we thought we'd made this very modest little film, you know, about an old guy signing on. And, um, but what it did was it tapped into a massive, massive debate. And, uh, and we had brilliant distributors called E1. And the guy who ran that was a lovely guy called Alex Hamilton. And he was so touched by the film. You know, he just said, I want the people who have got no money to see this in a crowd, which is music to our ears. Because it's one thing seeing it on a DVD, but it's another thing. They can't pay 11 quid to go and see it in the cinema. Okay. So after it went had the cinema run, Alex allowed the film to be... So trade unions, churches, church halls, schools. I mean, there was like 600 community screenings. And there was big, you know, like... People would be packed in, and then there was anger, and there was fury, and there was debate, and there was examples, and there was like linked to kind of you know activists, and so it was a, a remarkable experience. It was a beautiful thing, a beautiful thing for us because, you know, especially for me and Ken, I suppose we we try to tell these stories, you know, because you hope it'll have an echo and, and it'll change people's lives. Because one, well, like Mark said, one thing is to understand the world, another thing is to try and change the world, and films don't change anything. But if people do something afterwards, or empowers people, or gives them hope, then you can see change. And um, But it's also very important to know that even after all of this massive debate, and it had a real big influence in the UK, you know, it's now, my, my, my poor kids are studying at school, which is, makes me laugh. You know, and universities are teaching it, and, you know, judges and, and lawyers and doctors and institutions are all using the film. You know, so it's, it's really kind of penetrated, and people talk about the Daniel Blake Society. So it was great to have that penetration and it transcended into that debate. But what I never forget is that the Tories have not backed down one inch. There's still that vicious system in place and it'll take political change to move it. So I think we changed the narrative and how it was framed and people don't say they're all scroungers and wasters and, you know, the, you know, <coughs> you, know the, you know the word scrounger and waster? You know, somebody who benefits and steals, you know, welfare. There was a whole narrative that they thought that a third of the welfare budget was fraudulently stolen. And it's lies, it was less than 1%. So we've changed the narrative, but we haven't changed the reality about how people are humiliated and how food and hunger is still used as a political weapon. So it's a good question. Thank you. Uh, especially uh, w w the situation, the, the social situation is, is getting worse and worse uh, in, in the big countries like, like uh, uh, in Europe, in the United States and everything. Uh, how, how, is it more difficult for you to, to, to point the, 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 the unfairness than, uh, the, uh, and ask for more, more justice? Uh, is it more difficult for you to, to make film about that in U as in UK? Because of uh, you say of the right, the right wing uh, uh, criticize you and, and, and yeah. well, I mean, um, I mean, in the production uh, uh, in the yeah. production uh, mm. um, uh, world, is, is it more difficult to, to, to make th those kind of films or? Well, we're very very lucky because we've got the backing of a fantastic French company called Why Not. So I'm always very grateful to our French, our friends, brothers and sisters because um, our films have gone. And Ken has said this: if it hadn't been for the French public he still might, might not be making films. So um, Ken and I do collectively feel very, very lucky about how we've been received, particularly in France, you know, which, is, which has been brilliant. So what happens is we keep our films very, very cheap. You know, they're very cheap compared to most films, I think. They're very modest locations. They can't, don't use big stars. Um, and, um, and we get the, you know, a little bit of money from all the different distributors. And they've always been very loyal to us. So in a strange way, all this political attack they had, because it was mentioned in Parliament, our film Daniel Blake, it was very, very funny, actually. The guy who was the, the Minister for Welfare, um, you know, criticised our film after it won the Palme d'Or here, and he announced and, you know, he made a speech in Parliament. Then people asked him, well, have you seen the film? Uh, which is always an advantage to yeah. comment on. It's like reading a book, isn't it? You know, it's very hard. Anyway, so uh, anyway, he says, I haven't seen the film, but I've seen a trailer. I've seen the trailers. <laughs> yeah, I've right. seen the trailer. It was very funny. There was only one trailer. So he must have seen the same one again and again. I don't know. <laughs> so um, he was... Uh, and then uh, a whole bunch of right-wing politicians started criticizing us. But it was absolutely hilarious because every time they said we were lies or exaggerating, social media were bombarded with hundreds of thousands 
of you know similar cases that were even worse because actually we made the film not to be you know in an extreme he was actually very modest there was people dying of hunger and people with mental health problems and there's crazy stories we have told so every time they said it wow so they stopped talking about it you know so um so in a strange way it actually helped us you know, so um, so I don't know what will happen with this one, really. Because a film, you never know how it's going to go. You don't know if it's going to be ignored. You do, it's, it's really funny because it's a bit surreal. I remember being here with you, with Daniel Blake. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I remember having this conversation with you. And we said, well, who knows? It's about an old guy signing on. And, well, I, I don't know. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and uh, so it might very well, this time might be the opposite. You know, so yeah. you just, that's the funny thing about stories. You just, nobody can really quite tell. Mm. And uh, you, you told us that, that you are you are involved in, in each step of, of the film making. Uh, are you are you um, are you present on, on, on the set? And how how do, how, how does uh, uh, Ken uh, uh, speaks to you? How do he, he ask you your your advice or or maybe it's a, well, how, how how does it oh. work? Yeah, <laughs> Well, Ken is, he's one of these characters who, you know, like some people don't want writers about, you know, just to get the script and then they give it to another writer. And I don't know how all that works, but for us it's very organic. Um, and um, and he's a very inclusive man, really. You know, and he's, and I suppose because he's so confident that he's not intimidated by the presence of someone else. And also, we're just great mates. We have great fun. Most of the time on a set, I do absolutely fuck all. I have to admit <laughs> that. I mean, I don't do very much at all. But I enjoy being around everyone, and it's great fun. Uh, but a lot of the time is, sometimes you notice something, you know, and what is interesting is, because we shoot in sequence, you know, um, you can maybe suggest little, you know, little cuts or tweaks here and there because we shoot in sequence. And what's very interesting is, at night time we talk about it, and we said, well, if you notice him, he's, he's funnier than that person is, maybe change lines around, you know, or this works better, or maybe we should cut this. So it chops and changes a little bit, but not that much. And um, But also, it's, it's very, it's nice to be around and just give support, you know, and, and you know, some scenes, there's so much going on, and um, it's sometimes it's handy, Ken says, to have another pair of eyes there, you know, just to, well, keep an eye on this, or keep an eye on that, what happens here? Because we don't use monitors at all, there's no monitors at all. You know, you just try and watch what's going on. Ken doesn't like monitors because we should just just be concentrating on the people there and, and trying to make the actors feel comfortable and everything. But he's so generous. That he's not a guy who's intimidated. He wants you to be part of it. And another, but what is key as well is when we're doing the casting, Ken always says after doing the script, the most next most important thing is the casting. So what we do is we, there's a lovely casting director called Callie Crawford from Scotland, a friend from Glasgow, and she's got a great eye and sees things. And then we just see as many people as possible, some who are actors, some who are non-actors. Non and then we get a list, and then we get a smaller list, and a smaller list. We do little improvisations. But Ken always wants me to be there with him because it's in the process of doing the casting because he always says what we're trying to do is give flesh and blood to the script as best imagined. Yeah. And then, but in the process of seeing different people, you actually refine the character. Because in this particular case, we saw a lot of people who could maybe do one little bit or were terrific in this, but then they maybe didn't have another quality. Or someone can be very funny, or, or someone who can be really, really smart, but maybe they just don't touch you as much. You know, and again, it's instinct. And um, But that conversation that we have together just helps us refine the character. And we just try to come to a conclusion about you know who might best do it. Now in this particular case, I don't know if you'll get a chance to see the film, but um, the woman who plays Abby, she had um, she's a, an assistant in a school, and um, you know she works with kids who are you know like who need you know assistance and don't turn up or are in trouble and their parents are you know and so she's got a, there's something incredibly just generous and kind about her, and it's not an act; it's who she is. You know, you look at her and you just know. And you speak to her, and you listen to her, and there's just something about her, you know. And it's almost like so. And she'd she'd had one or two little lines as an extra, and you know, on, on, a, on a on a series in television, but she's never done a main part. But I mean, I love her performance because it's not a performance. It's almost like everybody just she just goes through it. She sails through it because she's so unselfconscious, but she's so herself, and um, and, uh, and and I just love her generosity, and but. You know, not many other people would take that chance because a lot of people would panic and say, "Oh no, what happens if she doesn't? You know, freezes. You know, what happens if she doesn't? You know, two weeks into it, you know." 
And a theatre did the same thing with a f this little film called Yuli. We found a little kid, you know, and he was just brilliant and sparky. And we was going, oh, but he's, oh, God, he's never done anything before. Whams after three days and he just disappears. Because it happened to her once in a previous film, you know. But she took the chance with it. You know, and I love it when you have directors who are brave like that. And I love it when you when you can feel part of that decision, you know, and, and that's the beauty of working with friends. If you can, I know if you, and so many of you are writers, if you can find someone who you can share that burden with, that you can, can encourage each other, because so often with a film, it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of, it's like a force of will, isn't it? You know, it's just in your head, and there's millions of other stories out there. So you've got to be so determined, and you've got to do it, and it can seem like a mountain. You know, and I mean, I've known some friends who have been fighting for 20 years to get their films made and they still haven't got it done. And it's heartbreaking. And the big, big difference, I think, is if you can find, you know, key collaborators so you can encourage each other who get different skills. So we've been very lucky with Rebecca O'Brien, our producer, and Ken, the director, and me as a writer. And so we've got this little company together and it's just three mates that got different jobs, but we all try and encourage each other. And it, and it raises everybody's spirit if you can do it. And good luck. Mm. 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 Uh, is, is it? Oui, oui. Um, non, pas encore. On a le temps. Uh, to, to be on the set uh, and watch the film you you have written, uh, um, been shooting, uh, is it is, is it helpful for you for for uh, for for your your work as 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 a, as a writer as uh, it, 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 it is helping you uh, the. Uh, as to, to feel uh, if, if the, the, mm. the scene uh, is going to fit or not, or... Mm. Um, um, well, probably, I'm not so self-conscious about it now, but I suppose after you've seen it done, you've got a sense <coughs> of really how short it's got, to, how short everything must be, because our films are short. You know, they're only about, this film is about 90-odd minutes, I think. 90, I can't remember, is it 90, 100 minutes? So it's, it's very short. So I think at the beginning I just made scenes far too long. And I think when you actually see it played, see it played out, then you get to realize just how concentrated it's got to be. So I think it's wonderful when, you're, when your writing really is. What I love about a film is when you see the levels, you know, there's a big suggestion of things beyond. Our story, a little story, is a story about a family. But beyond all of that, I, th I hope there's a richness about the things we talked about, but then equality about the, you know, the pressure in people. And but when you're writing the script, everything has to be. Um, and again, it's a matter of style, you know, because now a lot of people make films for three hours. I mean, I personally, I can't concentrate that length of time. I'm like a child, you know. I like things short, you know, and uh, a bit, bit shorter. So you can get a scene to do several things, and you get that sense that you're always moving forward. And I love it in a film when you're just, you drag forward all the time. You're not aware of, you know, the, you know, long, long kind of scenes. And I mean, again, it's a question of taste and there's some beautiful long films at three hours. Uh, but, you know, I think, you know, certainly for me, if there's pace to it and you're drawn in and you're moving on and you really feel the film clicking along, I mean, that's the type of stories I love, and then you're taken to a place, and suddenly you realise, holy Christ, the film's at an end, and you've just been in it like a child. And to get that, it has to be slick, and it has to be really, really tight, and you've really got to have thought about the structure. Otherwise, I think you can end up with cul-de-sacs and boring bits. And, but that, I mean, but everybody should, you know, find their own way. Mm. And uh, uh, do you or, uh, when you when you write, do, do you? Uh, uh, do you think about, about the sound uh, a lot, of, or or is it is it more Ken uh, as um, a director? Um, <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I think when you're writing, you have to try and imagine everything, really. Um, but in this particular film and Daniel Blake, I mean, I was very open to the idea of having no music at all because I just thought the reality was so kind of raw that I didn't want it sweetened up at all. So in this particular film. The irony is we work with um, with an absolutely brilliant composer, George Fenton. You know, he did the film Gandhi, he did a lot of film, other films where there was much more music. You know, for example, when Ken, I didn't write the script for this, Land and Freedom, George did the music for it. And the music from the Spanish Civil War raises the whole film. I mean, it actually just makes it sore. And the film would not have been half the film it was without the music. But with Daniel Blake and, um, and this one, Sorry We Missed You, 
Um, we really imagine to be very, very minimalist. So sometimes there's just little sounds and echoes and just to give a kind of a sense of an atmosphere to carry you along a little bit. But, um, you know, we're, so I was very aware of it and we both shared that we didn't want it sweetened up by the music at all. You know, so I think you have some sense of that. But also, I leave things open to um, to another great talent. And in the film Yuli, um, we were particularly lucky to work with a brilliant Spanish composer called Alberto Iglesias, who's done all the Almodovar films. And, uh, and, and he created some absolutely remarkably original music, you know, which is brilliant. And it raises it much, you know, because in, in this film, I imagined scenes told by dance, so I suggested what that might be. Then Athea had to work with a choreographer, and then because they needed a choreographer, they had to compose the music. So it was just suggestions, but they had to bring their talent and vision to make that, you know, it's one, it's one thing to do it on a page, but to actually get the dancers, get the music and everything to come together, and then to film it so that it feels seamless, you know, so that it weaves in and out naturally. That was a huge, huge challenge and very, very difficult, you know, so, that's the beauty about film too, you rely on so many other talents. You know, the DOP, the musician Albert, Alberto Iglesias, the, in this, in the, in the Yuli film, choreographer. And that's what makes the, the medium that we work in so bloody exciting. I mean, it's such a privilege to work with all those different elements. And w when, you were, when you were writing, do you have uh, already the music or is, is, the, is, the, is, the, compo is the music composer uh, is coming uh, later? But usually the music had to be done before for the choreograph scenes because they had to practice it before we shot it. But with Sorry We Missed You and the, how we work with Ken is uh, we just let George, George Fenton, come in and just watch the film and just let him sense it because he's got a great instinct, you know, and he understands our sensibility too. So they come in at the end and, and, and Ken does that with George. You know, so I'm, I'm not really involved in that, but I've got great respect for how they do it. But in this film, you'll see the, the music is very minimalist, which, I'm, which we talked about beforehand. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you talk about uh, being in, in, in the editing room. Uh, uh, how, how, does it, uh, how does it sound for, uh, how does it for, for a screenwriter to, to, to watch uh, uh, the script on the screen and, and see what's, what's wrong, what's good, yeah. and hear the, the, the directors, no, 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 cut that, cut that. Well, it's, well, there's no great surprises, really, because, because you're in the process all the way through. You know, there's, um, you know, me and Ken have gone through the script a thousand times. We'll say, well, this is too long, this is too expensive. You know, we've sat down, we've chosen the actors together. Then we sit down and we do the shoot and we start on day one and we finish. So there's no real surprises, you know, and, uh, and um, well, sometimes there's, but not many, really. I mean, in this particular, um, I was talking to the editor last night, You should get him along sometime, Jonathan, Jonathan, God, I should have got Jonathan here. It's a pity not, Jonathan's not here, Jonathan Morris, who's been working with Ken since 1979, I think. And he's directed, he's cut all his films. I mean, a lovely, very funny, warm man. You know, so going into the cutting room with Jonathan is verbal, verbal boxing, because he's, he's just funny. And, um, and uh, so he's a, he's, a, he's a great man, very, very, God, we should have got him to come along today. Because it'd be interesting to, you know, for him to talk about this and, and, um, and, but in this particular film, we actually cut very, very little from the film, you know, from, as the screenplay. Some of the old, the older ones, we, you know, more, more, more parts were cut out. But this one has been very, very tight, uh, very tight. Uh, when, when when the film is a success and when film is not a success, how, how does it... Uh how do you measure that? <laughs> How, no, no, not this one. I don't, I don't say this one. The, the previous film. How do, does it? Uh, how does it? The, the, does it feel uh, after when, when you when you write the, the next film? The, does it? Does it has an influence the way you write the next film? The success, success or, or the or less success, let's say. Um, to be honest, I, tr I try. For I, you and Ken, not for. Uh, I, tr I try not to think about it really. You know, I mean, just try not. To, there's nothing I can do about it. You know, I mean, I'm very glad that Daniel Blake. You know, you know, had this penetration. We didn't expect that, but it's and but you can't really expect the next one to to match that. And but in another way, I don't worry about it because there's nothing I can do about it. You know, what I mean, oh, I've got enough things to worry about that you you have some influence and control. And if you are just worried about things that you can't control, you'd just be a, a really miserable bastard, really, wouldn't you? <laughs> you'd just be miserable and upset. So, so um, I just try to forget about it. And, um, and the reality is Daniel Blake was written so long ago and actually 
this one was written so long ago that really my anxiousness is about the next one if we can find a way to doing another story you know so i try to just keep my um my paranoia and my anxiety at a low level really because there's nothing i can do about this the, the die is cast you know people could watch this tonight and then boo or the critics might all think oh here they go again banging on the same old drum you know we've all fallen asleep they should retire you know i mean <laughs> i mean they could it could be all of us you know but there's nothing i can do about it you know so so my family's here and we're just going to really really enjoy it have a good drink tonight we're going to dance a lot you might see a few kilts from scotland floating around <laughs> You know, so um, you've got to try and enjoy the moment as well because it's such a huge effort from everyone there. And we've made it with such close, you know, lovely friends. There's a whole gang here tonight. And um, and it's just, um, we'll just enjoy the moment and there's nothing you can do about it really. It's like, yeah, nothing you can, nothing you can there's no point worrying about it, you know. No. Famous last words. <laughs> What's the next, uh, uh, the next project? Oh, I have no idea. Yeah, no idea. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just daydreaming just now. Daydreaming. <laughs> daydreaming. Yeah, yeah. You're dangerous, really? Nicholas. Ah, well, yeah, yeah. No, we're just... We don't know if we'll... Well, we, d we don't know if we'll do another one, really, because Ken is now going to be... Um, he's going to be 83 next month. Uh, so um, he's due a rest. He's still got great intellectual vigour, you know, but he's got many other... He's got a fantastic family. You know, and, and there's many other things he can do. So he's my friend first. So um, I'm not sure what will happen. I, I don't know what will happen. But um, but uh, you know, hopefully I'll keep working for a little bit. You know, a little bit. Yeah, I'm 20 years younger. So. And as as a mm. as a screenwriter, not, not necessarily with, with Ken Loach. What's your next project? Uh, I'm I'm not sure yet. I'm, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm just daydreaming and digging around. And <laughs> okay. Yeah, I don't know what it's like with you in between projects, but there's a lovely moment when you're just digging around and everything is possible and there's a nice glow because the whole world looks fascinating and interesting. And then as time goes on, you've got to actually do something, you know, and make it focused and choose something. So all of that becomes a little bit, you know, you feel the weight of it. You know, uh, somebody's nodding there. Uh, are you doing that just now? Eh? <laughs> yeah, that's good. So um, at this stage, we're, we're just digging around and seeing what might be possible. Because it's very strange. It's actually, it's a quirky thing. And um, I think people who, you know, because some people say, well, why don't you do something about such and such? Because they're following the news. Something's happened last week. People say to me, why don't you do something about Palestine and Israel? You know, after the bombing and... You know, in in, in in you know in in, in in Gaza, and the thing is, you can't chase the news because by the time you you actually research it, you make it, you do it, and you get it out, two years can have passed. Yeah. You know, so I think you have to sense sense things in a different way. I think that's why you've got to go under the surface, and that's why I think listening to people is really really important. You know, just digging around, listening. You know, uh, finding out what's going on under the surface if you can. If you're a writer, I think trying to figure out what's going on underneath. You know, and I think that's what's very, very interesting about how all this poverty we talked about, this mass inequality, how that's fed into the body politic, how it's fed into fake news, how it's fed into the aberration of Trump. You know, there we have a man who's got a palace on Miami Beach who is denying, pulled us out of the Paris Agreement, the climate change, and denies climate change, blames it on the Chinese. I mean, it sounds so surreal, you can't actually believe it, you know, but the question is, you can get angry or mad at it, but the thing is, is try to understand, well, why are people voting for this man? You know, why are people accepting snake oil? Why do people follow these terrible lies? You know, we've got such mass, mass concentration of wealth, you know, so much human misery. These eight men who have 50% of the wealth of the world's population, but somehow it's the immigrants' fault, you know? I mean, what massive grand deceptions that, that we live and see through. So the thing is to try and understand it, you know, and try and figure out, you know, why have we got Trump? You know, what, what, is, what has led into that? You know, why have we got Salvini in Italy? Why have we got Orban, you know, in Hungary? Why have we got all these people who say, you know, you find a, a convenient scapegoat and who they pick on is always the poorest, you know, the poorest and the most vulnerable. How did they manage to persuade so many people that was the real problem? You know, so I think we have to be rigorous. That's why I always think, like, we have to, as writers and filmmakers, we have to be rigorous. 
We have to be demanding. We have to be analytical. We have to dig in, try and get the information, speak to people who understand it, people to speak to people who lived it. So in this particular story, sorry we missed you, the only way to do it was to go out and actually be with the drivers. You know, one thing is for someone to tell you face to face what his job's like. But if you spent the whole day with him and you know he's been bursting to go to the toilet for two hours, that's different. You know, or you see someone drinking energy drinks all day instead of eating proper food. You can see at the end of the day. If you see a guy after a 12 hour, 13, 14 hour shift and you look at his eyes and they're all red, that's different from somebody saying I'm tired. You know, so I think it's good to see them and to speak to them, to try and understand them, to put yourself in their shoes. Do you think, do you think uh, as a writer, uh, cinema can, can, can uh, make the world better in a way? Um, oh, I don't know, Nicholas, really. I mean, I, I, it's, it's an age-old question, isn't it? You know, um, can literature or film change anything? I think it can help change... It can help change people's, you know, point of view, it can help the narrative, it can help the discussion. I think it can do all those things. And I think it can help, but it's only one part of the equation. I just told you about Daniel Blake. I think it will help change the narrative, but we haven't changed the reality. And that means people coming in behind it, it means organizing, it means trade unions, it means people being creative, you know. And, uh, and so I think it can help the debate. You know, in the same way when they did Birth of a Nation many, many years ago in the United States, That helped give rise to the birth of the Ku Klux Klan again. So it can be used for good and bad. You know, so I don't think it's, you know, necessarily read the other way. Does it, I, I don't know, does anybody else want to say something? I'm, I'm talking far too much. If somebody else would like to... We, we, to, we, are, we are about to give the, the yeah, microphone. Yeah, I know, but if they, it shouldn't just be a question if they want to add or, or contradict or give a different opinion because it's... Um, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't feel I've got... I'm just trying to ex express how we work. And um, and that's just you know one of many possibilities. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we, on va passer aux questions. So if anybody has a question or want to say something, Paco, Paco, regarde, il y, y, y a le micro derrière. <coughs> yes, coming back to uh, what we discussed about uh, the effect of Daniel Blake uh, on people because it was a success, then a lot of people saw it, and now you say they are teaching that in schools, and um, it, it's always important to know that we're not doing that for nothing also, and that the connection with the audience, what I liked a lot with your work is that you get inspired even by actors coming in in the casting, and, and you, you take that life and make it into a story. Um, as you say, you, you became a screenwriter by accident, but you became a, a great screenwriter. And um, can you explain for people how you made your own way of telling stories? And everybody can do that on his own, but what was yours? Oh, I don't know. The, I, t I tried to give some sense of the accident by, you know, when I went to Nicaragua, I was an eyewitness and I was drawn to try and tell a story. So a lot of it was by trial and error, really. And I know now many people study screenwriting and study film, you know, and um, and it just wasn't my experience. I, I was studied as a lawyer, really. But um, I think what you try and do is just deal with whatever hand you've been given. I mean, law was a great, I drew great thing. I, mean, I didn't realize it at the time, but I think When you, when you study law or practice law, you have to make an argument, you have to be rigorous, you have to have the evidence. You know, now I know a lot of film is fictional, but I think s part of it has to be an argument. You know, even if it's a fictional character or a screenplay, a screenplay is an argument in favor of that person's point of view. So um, I think you just follow your instinct really and uh, try and make it tight. And, um, and um, I think it's also great to kind of watch other films, other films you like try and see something that totally surprises you, you know, and really brings you to an area that you would never have thought about because it's part so different from your sensibility. So I think just to be aware, or sometimes you might read a poem, or sometimes you might see something in the street, and I find that interesting things stick, stick in your brain, and then it might not, it might not give fruit till much later. I'll give you an example. We did a, I did a film with the Thier Boyain, It was called The Olive Tree. I don't know if anybody saw that little film. But it was about a 2,000-year olive tree 
that was dug up in Valencia and then it was transferred to a corporate headquarters because they like the image of the, of the trees. Now, that was an article that just stuck in my head because in Spain during the crisis, austerity, they were digging up these trees that were planted at the time of the Romans. You know, and I mean, I mean I, and in your gut it just feels wrong, doesn't it? A 2,000 year old tree with a big thick shape and lovely, lovely, I mean, it, it's been in symbiotic relationship with communities for 2,000 years, giving shade and food to the community, <laughs> giving olive oil, giving health, and then the community looking after that. And then suddenly it's just dug up and sold. There's actually a hundred of them outside the headquarters of Santander Bank in Madrid. There's something sticks in your gut about that. You go, but why is that annoying me so much? And um, it annoyed me for five years. And then I had a bit of space and I went with a the theater to see these places. And then I went along and I talked to people who sold the trees. And I saw what desperation they were in. And then I did the harvesting with them. And then we harvested the olive oil and we, we tasted olive oil. But then it made us think about like, you know, corporate images and, and you know, what, what is valued. And, and, um, and then, you know, before we knew it, we had a little story about a grandfather and a grandchild who had a very close relationship with that tree. You know, so, so I think the way is, I mean, I don't think you can teach those things in film school. I think you just have to be aware and encourage everybody's talent. And then I think the good thing about film schools is you probably see a lot of good films and probably get some good advice. And I'm sure if I went, I would learn a lot as well from people who have got experience in teaching. You know, so um, I would just um, just try and be aware and be self-critical and be curious. You know, so and if you're if you're lucky, then you'll find good people to collaborate with. You know, that that was certainly my journey. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for your time. Um, I wanted to know if you wrote the punchline, I'm not a man, I'm Cantona, <laughs> <laughs> um, if it was Eric. Um, it's funny you asked me that question. Could you hear that question at the back there? I don't know. Could you, could you hear it okay? Did anybody... You spoke quite quietly. I don't know if people at the back oh. here. Did you hear? Could you hear that question? Okay. Maybe give it again. Say it a bit louder. Aye. Okay. Uh, I was wondering if um, mm. Paul Laverty uh, wrote uh, the punchline, I'm not a man, I'm Cantona in Looking for Eric. Yeah, well, I, it's a, it's a, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, I re actually, you know something, it's quite funny because I remember actually writing that particular line because... I don't, for people who haven't seen the film, it's little Eric meets the big Eric, you know? And then he's had too many spliffs and he's seen him in his imagination. And then there was a point, you know, where little Eric is asking Eric about what was the greatest moment of his sporting life, the type of thing that I would, I, I love football. You know, and so I asked Eric all this, you know? And, um, and so when I came to write it, you know, little Eric is going to have, you know, because he's such a star and he scored all these brilliant, iconic goals, and it's hard for many people of your generation to remember because he was actually the first big star and he was also the big, big star of Manchester United. And they hadn't won the league for years. So when they got Cantona, he changed absolutely everything. He was a mega star in the UK. And anyway, so he's banned from having uh, played football for nine months because he did a karate kick in some racist who swore at him. You know, and um, anyway, so little Eric was talking to him and he goes, Eric, you know, all those great goals. This is sometimes forget you're just a man you know a human being and I thought that was the end of the scene and then all I heard was Eric's voice I am not a man I am Cantona uh, and then I'll never forget one of the this was much better than one in the palm door one day I was watching football and then it went to it was Manchester United I think they were playing Barcelona and the and the and the camera went into some of the fans and they had a big huge sign I am not a man I am Cantona and the commentator started, you know, he read it out and he says, you should go and see that film of Eric Cantona. <laughs> and then they started selling T-shirts in Manchester United. I am not a man, I am Cantona. So, uh, so it came about by accident. Yeah, I wrote it. But uh, so that's, I mean, you know, sometimes you're just ambushed by, by little moments. Yeah. It was great fun, Big Eric. Lots and lots of fun. Yeah. It's just one of the best line ever. Uh, yeah. I'm listening to it very often when I don't feel good. <laughs> <laughs> it was really... Uh, there was another lovely moment with Eric Cantona because, um, because he, was, he played football and he was a total star. I remember asking him, Eric, you know, you've been playing in front of these 50,000 people. You know, you're the star. Everybody sings your name more than any other name. And then you've been banned for nine months, you know? 
And I said, you know, and your whole life was dedicated to those two games on a Wednesday night and a Saturday. And it goes, all that energy, all that creation, all that, you know, where did, what did you do for nine months when you were t that was all taken away from you? And he goes, I learned to play the trumpet. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, that's fantastic. And I goes, are you any good? And he goes, no. <laughs> and then I loved that because I, then I thought, fantastic. And I said, Eric, I don't know how, but I'm going to get you playing the trumpet in this. But just promise me one thing that you don't practice. And then there's a, fi a scene in the film which I actually love. And, it, and this, this is why I love cinema. There's a film, and he's on the balcony talking to little Eric. Because the whole basis of the story is Eric's got this great big giant talent as a footballer. Okay? And he can do anything with a ball. But when he comes to play a trumpet, he's absolutely shit. He can't do anything. You know? And, I love, and little Eric, he's got other talents. You know? And, and it was a sense of, and, and then what he does, he, he starts playing, you know, because the, the, the tune the Man United fans was, ooh, ah, can't I, ooh, ah, can't I, with, the, you know, the, with, you, with, you, with your national anthem. And Eric plays this all fingers and thumbs, and, ah, 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 and it is, and it's, and it's, to me it's hilarious, and it's a love song to Manchester with this man who's a genius footballer, but a terrible musician, and underneath it we're all kind of human beings. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. <laughs> So, um, so it was a, uh, it was a lot of fun. That's a fun. And he, he, and I know he's got a big personality, and he looks like a big extra. He was actually quite shy, and he was a wonderful team player, and he was a lovely, lovely man. Uh, we had great fun working with him. Very modest with us as well. Yeah, just uh, as an echo of what you said, the words, uh, I'm not a man, I'm Eric Cantona, it sounds like uh, you made of Eric Cantona the first of the Avengers, did you? <laughs> <laughs> well, more seriously, um, when, um, when Nicolas, Nicolas told you about the success of your movie and you asked uh, how can you estimate it, uh, I think um, well, the, the, the reaction, the criticism of the politicians uh, can be a good uh, sign for you for the, the, about the success okay. of, the, of the film. And uh, when my question is, uh, did it ever happen uh, that um, you had an idea about a, a project, about a scenario, and then um, maybe you thought, maybe the project was aborted because you thought that the idea was too subversive or too controversial? Mm -hmm. can, can we, the general question is, can you write about everything uh, in a script, you know, because you speak about politics, there are other subjects, as the, the church, for instance. And, I mean, you denounce inequalities, uh, deviances, I don't know. Yeah, um, well, uh, the only limitation we have is our own imaginations, really, isn't it? Um, and I think it's, uh, as, I, as I got older, I'm, you know, we have told stories in a very, that, that, you know, there's a quite traditional manner. The stories I've done with the theatre have been more unusual because they've be jumped from different, gen, you know, 500 years of apart and time being like you be even the rain. Um, but I think cinema's got every, you know, I think I think it's got great possibilities. You know, I, I think the big big question is is um, there's limitations. There's no limitation in your imagination. There's limitation in your budgets, and there's limitation in what your distributors might might have you do. And uh, again, that's very very difficult. You know, because we made this film about, for example, Yuli, about a Cuban ballet dancer. I mean, the budget was so tight it was unbelievable. But if that film had been made in English, we'd have got a much bigger budget. But if we'd done that, the whole film would have been false. You imagine all the beautiful Cubans speaking Denzel Washington playing Carlos Acosta's father. It would have been absolutely ridiculous and stupid. And everything that made Cuba beautiful would have been undermined. The Cuban accent, the language, the spark, the people there, the kids in the street. And that's what I love about the film, was the ordinary people. And that's what made it genuine. Um, so I think it's a very tricky, even the rain took us 10 years to make, because people said, well, that's a bit weird, you know, you know, you're dealing with 500 years ago and the water wars in, in Cochabamba, privatization of water now and the robbing of gold 500 years ago. Can you make that work in a film? And we looked at the script and people said, well, it's a very, I remember Thier and Juan Gordon, a lovely producer in, in, uh, from Morena Films in, in Madrid came up here. And we went round, we went round all these hotels and they pitched the story and everybody said, that's very interesting. But um, it sounds a bit risky. We don't know if we'll give you any money for it. You know, so it's always that balance of trying to figure out what you can get away with, you know. And, um, and I suppose if you are going to do something that's, you know, very risky, anti-narrative, 
Maybe you just have to be some more subversive about how you do it. Maybe you do it as one man and a camera. I don't know. One man and a dog. One man and a bicycle. One woman and a bicycle. You know, I think you just have to find different ways if you're going to do that. Um, you know, because I always think, you know, people say, well, why don't you do a film in Gaza? Why don't you do a film in such and such? You know, and that's what they should be doing. You know, but the thing is, how do you get, how do you get access and, and you know, to get it out there in this world now where there's just millions of things being done? You know, um, so I think nothing's off, off limits, but you have to be very canny about, you know, what is possible. Thank you. Somebody over there, yeah. Hi. De la formule. Euh, bonjour. Bonjour et merci. Thank you and good. And good uh, and... Je vais la formuler en français parce que voilà, vous allez la traduire. Euh, je voulais savoir ce que il pouvait penser d'une politique euh, d'un cinéma qui aurait une vertu pédagogique et qui s'inscrirait dans une logique d'éducation culturelle, euh, mais sociétale aussi. Et je pense cette question vient parce que enfin là, là je vois sur Twitter que euh, les lycéens de Mantes la Jolie, euh, euh, enfin selon euh, l'IGPN, la directrice de l'IGPN, il n'y aurait pas de faute, euh, enfin les policiers n'auraient pas commis de faute. Mais quand même, il y a eu euh, une rafle, on peut dire, d'enfants euh, qui ont été mis agenouillés à, à Mantes la Jolie et collés la tête contre un mur. Euh, pendant euh, tu, toute une après-midi et je voulais savoir ce qu'ils pouvaient en penser et ce que le cinéma peut avoir euh, comme, euh, comme valeur euh, par rapport à, à un événement euh, qui est quand même assez euh, atroce. Euh, je dire, en fait. Tu veux traduire euh, C'est compliqué comme question. Uh, the, the question is, uh, is has the cinéma of... Uh, Uh, pedagogical virtue, yeah, is, educational can virtue. Cinema become uh, uh, a way of education, um, and um, she was citing a, a, an event that happened where the police um, oppressed some students. That's a recent fact, and uh, it's a case of injustice and awkward behavior uh, that happens everywhere in the world, and uh, can film, uh, explain that, and transform society. Thanks very much for your question, and I'm very sorry I, I can't answer in, in French. Uh, but thanks for your question. Um, well, I think film has got great possibilities, you know, uh, for both good and bad, uh, because it's such a powerful medium, you know, because cinema can change point of view. You know, you mentioned the story of, you know, just as you say it, you could tell that story in all sorts of subversive ways, you know. Who are the policemen who beat up the students? Can you imagine that policeman going back home in the evening, seeing his own teenage sons? You know, what does he feel like after what he's done? And that might be a more subversive way of telling the story. You know, because you think, oh well, it's easy to do it from the guy who is bloody and beaten, and um, you know, and and it could be a much more obvious way to tell the story. But I think the beautiful thing about cinema and telling stories is you can subvert expectation. You could tell the story from their point of view, but what about the guy who sold the gun? You know, what does he feel like? So there's maybe subversive ways of doing it. And the beautiful thing about cinema is, and telling stories is, you can just change point of view. And you can present things in a very immediate way. Um, because cinema is so powerful, because you've got the image, you've got the sound, you've got the suggestion, you've got music, you know, and, um, and that they're very, very powerful tools. So again, I think the limitation is your own imagination. So it could be done to favor oppression, and many, many stories are. And um, I think there are many, many stories that glorify violence. Look at all the many of the war stories. I think they glorify violence. And um, so that is no surprise. But there are also great possibilities of subversion with film, which can change people's minds forever. And I think well, in our own lives, there's probably moments you have read a book for him. I mean, I remember when I read Primo Levi, you know, the writer. After you've read a book by Primo Levi, I mean, I don't know how you're different, but you're different, you know. Yeah, so, you know, I'm not saying our films were anywhere near the standard of Primo Levi, but, you know, sometimes when you see a great work of art, it can change you, change something deep inside you, and I suppose that's what we're trying to do. But to do that requires imagination and to try and really, really think and be subversive and be demanding. <laughs> but thanks for your question, it was a very good one.
come back to writing. Uh, aren't you interested in uh, writing for the very à la mode series? At least you have time to develop the characters. Um, um, <laughs> the question about developing a series. Um, I mean, I'm interested in. I mean, in, in, in theory, I am. Yeah, I mean, I think to, ha to try and tell a story over eight hours or longer would be a remarkable challenge. I mean, it'd be a, a huge challenge. And, um, and I think it's something that could be very, very satisfying. It's not something I've done. I've been asked many times, you know, t to do it. And, um, and uh, I just haven't had, had the time to do it. But um, I think it could be a beautiful project if you work with the right collaborators. And, and you could be a, what's very, very important to Ken and Athea and myself is, and Rebecca, Brian, our producer, is that we have control of the material. You know, and my fear is with these big series, when you're asked to do something, you're like a hired hand, and um, and they decide at the end of the day what the heart of it is. But um, for example, when we did the Wind That Shakes the Barley, I don't know if you've seen that little film, we did it in Ireland. And um, now for, for that project, because it was so complex, I had to understand the war, the Irish, the War of Independence. But then what was much more complex was the second part of that war of it, the civil war when Irish started fighting each other. So as part of that, I did a, a history of each, each character. Now, the great difficulty in that film was, you know, to have so much history, but also space for character, all done in two hours. Now, in that particular incident, probably when it was all in my head, I'd love to have done an eight-part series. I would love to have done that because you'd explore different characters, different themes, you know, and done it over a longer period of time with a big budget. And that would be a magnificent challenge to do, you know, because at the end of the day, it's just having the story fit the medium, you know? And um, so if you do a short film, it's got, to, it's got to fit, you know? If you do a short novel, if you do a play, you know, I'd love to do a, you know, maybe a, a ballet or a musical. You know, again, you'd have to get something that fits that and something. But to do an eight-part series would be a, a remarkable and beautiful challenge. But at the end of the day, the general principles of storytelling would still have to, to work, really. You know, in other words, the premise has to be strong and you've got to have great characters, you know, and, um, and then you'd have to try and really work that out. And it'd be a hell of a lot of work, but um, a beautiful challenge. But I haven't done it. But um, if I have any energy and more time in the future, I would love to have a crack at it. Yeah. I have a question about, about uh, writer-producer uh, collaboration. What is your advice uh, for a writer? Uh, which uh, uh, relationship should he, should he have uh, with, with the, or she have with, with, uh, with the producer? Um, well, <laughs> to be honest, I, I, again, I'm, I've had the great fortune of working with a very small group of people. You know, with Ken, the third person and who, who works with us is Rebecca Bryan who's often forgotten, and I never fail to mention her because she's super important to how all of us work. I mean, she's a key part of, part of the team. And, um, but because of her work, she's more in the background. But she raises all the finance and allows us to work. And, um, you know, so my relationship with Rebecca is very, very simple, and she's a great friend. But um, she kind of leaves me and Ken just to go on with it. You know, I, I really ask her to read it, but, you know, her job is really... She's just a very imaginative producer who raises the money and helps us make what we want to try and do. And with Juan Gordon uh, of Moreno Films, who I've worked with Athir a number of times, again, you know, he, I'm very interested in what he thinks and, and, and how he's touched by it. But at the end of the day, he just allows us to get on with it. And I'm very, very keen that, you know, that the, the me and the director are the ones that kind of really have the, the final say on the, on the material. And I know that not everybody is in that position. And I know if the budget's got much higher, that might be impossible. So, um, so I'm not really the best person to ask because I've just worked very closely with two friends. I, I couldn't give advice about working with, a, with another producer. Um, it depends what kind of work you're interested in and whether you find a theme with that person and you share a similar sensibility. But um, what I think is very, very important is that if you're going to spend two years of your life or three or four or five years of your life in a project, sometimes you do that, just make sure you know the person. Because sometimes you don't know until you work with them. And if you're four or five years into work and you have a big fight, it's a lot of wasted of energy and a lot of bitterness and a lot of heartache. So just make sure that you want to try and you've got a similar sensibility. Otherwise, it can be great friendship or it could be absolute misery. Question. 
<laughs> I've exhausted you all, that's it. Yeah. Uh, Scotland won, France nil. Hey. <laughs> okay, then uh, we have to thank you very much, Paul, Hi. for coming. Hi. And Hi. great success. Too sorry, I missed you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks very much. Hi. Hi. And can I just, um, you know, just one, one, one little thing. First of all, thank you for coming. Um, I think this beautiful things about festivals is dialogue, sharing, listen to each other. I've just been going around the north of England just recently, just digging around, talking to people, and I'm amazed, I don't know what's happening in France, but how places where people meet are fast disappearing before our eyes. You know, and in the UK, the libraries are closing down, the churches are closing down, community centres are closing down, the pubs where people drink are closing down. You know, and I think it's quite remarkable. So. Places where people can meet and listen to each other with respect, but also to share something in common is, is a beautiful thing. So, so thank you for that in the festival. And also, for those people who are right now trying to get their film made, you know, really good luck with it. Uh, and one thing is really important to remember too, no matter where you've come from, you know, there's, there's all sorts of advantages about wealth and education and all that. But at the end of the day, there's something quite democratic about a beautiful idea, originality doesn't go with wealth you know so you've got something and you believe in it and it's worthwhile it's really worthwhile fighting for and it's original it might very well find the light of light of day and i hope one day you'll have your films up there in the big pally and if i do i'll be a very very happy man so good luck to you all eh? yeah